Hello, good evening, and welcome to the TNT Show. I'm John Drummond, and I'm your host for the next 60 minutes. Thanks to you, the TNT Show and Indie Live are growing and delivering more and more exciting shows. And you can watch this TNT show on IndieLive.net. It's streamed out to YouTube, Facebook, TikTok, Twitter, and other platforms. Plus, on YouTube, you can view all of the previous 150-odd shows. So if you're upset by media coverage of political events where journalism is often junked in favour of stenography uh, and perhaps rehashed news releases, if you're looking for an alternative voice. Well, you found it. We're here for you. Now's your chance to be here for us. Uh, please support the crowdfunder. You'll find the details on Indie Live. It's hugely important uh, to keep all of these channels working. And it's particularly important, if I may add, at this time, because at this time, most of print newspapers are in serious financial difficulty. Uh, the Daily Record, the parents of the Daily Record, uh, a company called Reach, which also publishes, ironically, the Daily Express. <laughs> There's two unlikely bedfellows, if you want to call it that. Um, and uh, they are all having trouble. They're all having trouble. Uh, and they're stuffed full of ads. Uh, so their costs, to some extent, uh, have been uh, taken care of to a degree. Obviously, they do depend on sales over the counter, but not as much as they used to. Uh, and advertising, too, is being cut back. So, you know, the, the printed papers are in a serious, serious difficulty. Well, you know, it's been another great day for British democracy. Jackie Bailey, no less, has become a dame commander of the British Empire. I don't know about you, but the last time I looked for the British Empire, it didn't exist. She was, she's a dame commander of something that doesn't exist. Uh, she clearly does not share the views, of course, of Keir Hardy. You may recall Keir was the first leader of the Labour Party, who said, and I quote, In this country, loyalty to the monarch is used by the profit mongers to blind the eyes of the people. We can have but one feeling in the matter, contempt for thrones and for all who bolster them. <laughs> so, uh, Dame commander of the British Empire is clearly completely and utterly odds uh, with the first leader of the Labour Party. Tonight we'll be talking to another excellent guest, uh, lawyer and politician Eva Cymru. Now, among the subjects we'll be covering uh, is the common ground that might or perhaps doesn't exist between Alaba and the SNP and what Eva thinks of how well the benefits system works and importantly why she supports independence. And she'll be taking your questions live. And there's still time to get your question considered. Uh, right now, I've got five questions that people have already sent us. So we have a wealth, a richness of questions to ask tonight. You'll find the details if you want to send a question on screen. And we'll try, we only have an hour, to do as many as we possibly can. As you know, TNT stands for the Nation Talks. So in many respects, this is your show. We're live and we're free, so no license, no problem. And you may have noticed, by the way, uh, based on the latest figures for one of the BBC Scotland shows, we're actually, on the face of it, based on our numbers, uh, we have an audience greatly in excess of their show. And heaven knows what they're spending on that. Uh, it will be part of the 300 million that they squander every year. Now, to our guest, Eva Comrie. Thanks for joining us, Eva. How are you? It's a great pleasure to be here, John. I'm very grateful for the invitation and thank you for that stirring introduction. I particularly enjoyed your words about the monarchy and the honour system being a lifelong Republican. I clearly look forward very much to the independent Republic of Scotland, which I hope will be with us very soon. Um, now, now, how much do you reckon your views on the monarchy chime with the Scottish public? I think it's become absolutely clear over the course of the last decade or so that support for the monarchy in Scotland is on the wane. And that has increased as the result of the death of the Queen and her replacement with the King, because whether folk like me like it or not, the Queen had a very special place in the hearts of many, a place that is denied to the King for various reasons, not least of which is that in a modern democracy, 
privilege and rank and pomp should have no place. But I think that the last few years, particularly of austerity and want, have reinforced that there are the haves and the have-nots. And the Scottish people just don't like that because in the main, we're a pretty fair-minded, egalitarian, democratic nation. And for all of those reasons, I think that the monarch's days in Scotland are numbered. Really? Now, you talked about getting rid of uh, all sorts of stuff there, including pomp. But don't you think people like a little bit of pomp in their lives? They like to see a procession or two. That, that, that's, I mean, for example, let's assume that you get your wish, right? And many people watching and listening tonight will fervently hope that you do. But let's assume you get your wish and the place becomes a republic. All republics have a head of state. You have to have a head of state. Uh, did I say it to keep the politicians in order? So, so, so you would have to have some sort of pomp associated with that. Otherwise, you're going to have some guy or woman just wandering the streets saying, look, I'm the head of state. It doesn't sound awfully good. It's horses for courses and everything within reason, particularly when, as I've said already, we've had austerity for too long and we're currently living in a United Kingdom which is completely imbalanced and the gaps in attainment and in life expectancy, etc., between the rich and the poor are far too wide. Of course, I would want an elected head of state. Um, nobody in their right mind would think otherwise. But what's very precious and very important to remember is that the stone of destiny, which belongs to Scotland, was valued and treasured because kings of Scots and queens of Scots were answerable to the people because the people were sovereign. And that's at the heart of the Scottish psyche and needs to remain so. So if there is to be pomp or any form of Scottish circumstance, it has to be done in the context of a celebration of the rights and the privileges and the responsibilities of all of the citizens of a republic and not simply representation of some sort of fanfare um, pretense that somehow a family who have inherited wealth and inherited status have any better standing in the country than the ordinary people for whom our country ought, our country's heart ought to beat more strongly. Okay. Uh, well, I suspect some people might agree with that. Uh, I, I, having a head of state is sort of complicated business. You would need to have a written constitution which enshrined that particular uh, official. Of course. Uh, no otherwise, every politician would, would clamour for the job. <laughs> <laughs> we want a written constitution for lots of reasons and the last couple of years in Scotland have made it clear that there are various groups within our country when we are independent who will benefit substantially from having their rights set out in a written constitution, uh, not least the rights of women given what we've seen in various controversies in the last few years and likely to see more coming down the track. So I am absolutely 100% in favour of a written constitution. Um, the, the, the fact that the UK doesn't have one has made life too easy because the flexibility of the unwritten constitution is something that has been um, at the heart of many of the most difficult instances of the history of this union. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, it, it's a tricky one. I, I mean, I, to some degree, I mean, I'm largely in favour of what you just said, but the, the reality is that an unwritten constitution allowed the UK to build an empire far quicker than it would have done under different circumstances because it allowed uh, Westminster to take decisions without necessarily going back and consulting the people, which would probably be required of a written constitution. I mean, take, for example, what happened recently. It is a classic symbol of that. The Prime Minister decided that he was going to uh, bomb <laughs> parts of Yemen, one of the poorest countries in the world. Uh, there was nothing constitutionally that required him to go and consult with Parliament, uh, even though he said when he took office that that's exactly what he would do. Uh, the leader of the opposition also said that's what he would do if it came to military action. And he recanted on that and said it wasn't necessary. And I don't think the leader of the SNP was ever consulted, the third largest party. So it is a mess. There's no question. I don't think many, you don't, I, I suspect you get nobody to argue with that when you say it's a mess. The question, more importantly perhaps, is what would replace it? What would replace the mess? What would you suggest would replace the mess that, that, that was. Let's assume that independence happened tomorrow. What, what, yeah. What's the first thing that you would like to see happen? Sorry, what's the first thing I'd like to see happen in, yeah. in an independent country? Yeah, let's, let's assume that, a deal, uh, that, 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 that there was a, a vote of some kind, something took place whereby 
the uh, it was decided that Scotland. We'll come back to how it got decided in a second. But the first thing that you would do as head of the first Scottish government operating independently, what would what would be the first thing you would do? Right, I'd take this in stages because, from my perspective, the most dreadful ill facing Scotland today is inequality. And the greatest driver of inequality is poverty. So what I would do, if I were to rule Scotland, would be on day one, look at introducing measures to tackle poverty immediately. Because poverty in some parts of our country is generational and it's cyclical. Mm -hmm. And there are some folk born into poverty who simply do not have the personal resources, let alone the financial resources, to bring themselves or lift themselves out of that. So right. I begin with addressing immediately the question of universal basic income, the potential for increasing pensions. I'd be looking at difficulties with housing because we know that housing costs, especially where housing is substandard, are serious matters which contribute substantially to people living beneath the poverty right. line. Okay. I would look at things like an energy company, a state-owned energy company, because obviously in Scotland we know that we are self-sufficient in energy if we were able to become independent. And we also know that the energy prices that we're paying just now are unnecessarily high. So okay. I cannot restrict myself to one measure. There is a raft of measures which could be implemented had okay. we the power to run our country the way we want it to be run. Got it. Well, there you are, Denise Finlay and uh, Andy McCall. You've got an answer to your question. Uh, I mean, essentially, uh, Eva would have uh, a comprehensive list of laws, not just one. Uh, uh, I suppose you'd have to give one precedent over all the others. What would it be? Because you mentioned energy company, you mentioned addressing poverty, inequality. What would be your first law? The very question that Denise asked. Let's, let's answer that. Let, let's be sensible about this. Um, let's look at some statistics. Last year in Scotland, 39,000 homeless applications were made, of which 32 were considered, in fact, to be proper homeless applications. Yeah. 32,000. That's a disgrace. A couple of years ago, the drug statistics in Scotland were, again, the highest in Europe. They've continued to be so. They dipped a bit last year. They're going back up again this year. There will be more than 12, 1,300 people dying drugs deaths unnecessarily in Scotland. Okay. If you look at where these deaths occur, they occur whether it's drugs deaths or alcohol-related deaths or deaths by suicide. They occur predominantly in areas where poverty is rife. You are 15 times more likely to die a drugs-related death in the most needy areas of Scotland than you are in the most affluent so okay. poverty is what has got to be targeted immediately, not simply for the sake of society, but for the sake of individuals. So I'm not going to restrict myself to, to one policy area one, or, or to one particular policy. I would say we'll have to look at a whole policy area okay. and address that's, it. That's fair enough. What would, what would you say to critics that say, and you must have heard them on television consistently, and say, how are you going to pay for all of this, Eva? The same way that we pay our way and more in the UK. I mean, I hope you saw today the, the um, questioning by Ash Reagan, Alba MSP of the government minister, where it was conceded that it is the case today and it has been the case for several years that Scotland's energy wealth subsidises the cost of energy for every household in the United Kingdom. That is what the government minister from Westminster conceded today. Scotland is a wealthy country. Don't believe what you read in Gers or Gers or whatever you want to call it. That's propaganda. Yeah. Well, we, 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 and that's why they're holding on to us. Yeah. If we were the, you know, the two wee, too poor, too stupid jocks that were characterised as, we would have had our independence a couple of hundred years ago. They're holding on to us for what they can sap out of us. That's what they're doing. And, you know, the whole world knows this. This is not news. I, I don't. I, I'm not sure they do. I mean, uh, it, uh, we, we addressed this at uh, the last TNT show last week, which featured Richard Murphy. And uh -huh. frankly, I, I would commend Richard's remarks to everybody tonight. If you didn't get a chance to see it or listen to it, go on to YouTube and check it out. He d he deals with Jers, he deals with Keir Starmer, he mm -hmm. deals with why he as an Englishman reckons that Scotland should be independent. But the section on Jers was particularly eloquent. 
And uh, uh, he said, and I'm paraphrasing now, but by and large, he said this. He said, look, he says, even a first-year accountant uh, wouldn't manage to produce the biggest mess as JERS does in accountancy terms. Leaving aside the politics of it, leaving aside the economics of it, he says, from an accounting uh, position, it's just plain wrong. It's as simple as that. So the question is this. Over the years, every Scottish government has published chairs. Mm -hmm. And that includes governments headed up by Alex Salmon. Mm -hmm. So the question is, why does the Scottish government consistently shoot itself in the foot this way? Well, that's not really a question for me, quite frankly. But you were asking me about how would Scotland pay its way? How could I govern Scotland and do all the things that I want to do at day one? And I was explaining to you that Scotland's a wealthy country. What people need to understand, and I think that most folk do, out with as well as within the political bubble, is that when we are independent, we will order our priorities to suit ourselves. We will not be spending money on, for example, Trident. Scotland will not be subsidising infrastructure and transport, etc., that benefits only the southeast of England. In addition, what Scotland will do, and I know Douglas Chapman, MP from the SNP, of course, and Neil Hanvey from Alba, are desperate to see the reinstatement of a ferry service from Scotland to Europe. When that right. ferry is reinstated, which it will be, that will increase trade to and from Scotland and our European neighbours who want to visit us will be able to come directly to Scotland without having to travel through any other part of the United Kingdom. We will take our place as a real, true, independent nation standing shoulder to shoulder beside the rest of the world, taking decisions that are for the benefit of the people of this country and we will participate fully, fully in all aspects of international life. And that will include not being relegated to a photocopying cupboard or a back room somewhere up a close in some British consulate. We will have our own properly functioning, properly afforded Scottish international relations offices where we steadfastly, without interference from the United Kingdom, will promote every aspect of Scottish life, including particularly Scottish education. And we will promote, as we used to do under the Erasmus scheme and as people are trying to do again now, we will promote the notion that European and other students can come to Scotland to study and our Scottish students will be freely able to travel to Europe and wider afoot and learn and negotiate and interact internationally because we are an international outlooking nation. The Scots always have been way back to the days of William Wallace. We were a, a nation who participated in international life. We were not restricted to being warmongers. We were educated and educating the rest of the world. And that is what I hope Scotland will continue to do even more than is currently available under devolution. Mm. We need to be outward looking because that's who we are. Okay. Your aspirations strike a chord with our audience and the, your plod the plaudits are flooding in. Uh, but I want to ask you some real politic questions. Mm -hmm. uh, and one is, uh, how would you bring this about? I mean, uh, to the best of my understanding, Alaba are ra fairly languishing in the polls when it comes to elections. So how would you take these aspirations and make them realise them from that very, very modest base? Uh, I, I mean, are you yeah. saying that you would that, that Scotland would have to elect a majority of Alaba MPs or MSPs, how, how would this happen? Right, I'm assuming that you're asking me how do we deliver independence to the people of Scotland? No, I'm asking you how Alaba is going to deliver independence. Well, that's really the same question. How does Scotland become independent? Scotland how does it become independent then? As the result of the ballot box. Right. There will have to be an electoral event. That will either be an election or it will be a referendum. Now, you'll not be surprised at all to know that I don't currently favour the referendum line because I think it's been a dead duck for a long time. I also believe that the application to the Supreme Court was, unfortunately, supreme folly. What I believe, and the law is there to back it up, is that Angus Brendan McNeil, along with Chris McElhenney, who's obviously the Alba Party General Secretary, have for a very long time, since they were both members of the SNP, where they are no longer members, obviously, they have both spoken at length 
about different methodologies over years, long before Alaba was invented. And so what have they said? simply stated is that there can be an election at Holyrood that is, in essence, a de facto referendum. The okay. law is facilitated. Okay. So let me, let, me, let me just trace this through, because this is going to be important. I mean, well, I, I'm going to explain this to you, John. Okay. If you let me finish, please. Fire what away. We saw earlier this week in Westminster was Neil Hanvey's self-determination bill. And I tell you, I, I threw up a cheer when I learned that every single SNP MP in Westminster voted with Neil Hanvey and Kenny McCaskill from Alba and with the others of independent mind and other SNP people who had originally supported it, so that there was what we would call a super majority of support for that bill from the MPs representing the interests of the people of this country. You know, MPs who were democratically elected to go down there and seek to okay. further the Scottish cause. So, so what I, happens now then? Well, wait, wait a minute, John, you like to interrupt me, but I'm going to finish this because I know where you want me to go. So position with Westminster is clearly because the vote was lost. The Tories abstained. Labour voted against it. It no, means the Tory, not all the Tories abstained. All bar one who voted for it. But leave that to one side. What it well, means, it's an important consideration because you could rightly point out that more Tories voted for that measure than the Labour Party did. Well, of course, but we say well, Labour voted against it, which says all you need to know. But we know that the Scottish voice counts for nothing in Westminster. Labour don't need Scottish votes to win a Westminster election. And even if they did, the difficulty for the Scots is there is no difference between a red Tory and a blue Tory. Bottom line, Scotland votes Labour at the next general election. Scotland can whistle for any form of benefit. Okay, that, that, that's what might not happen. What, what do you propose happens? Propose. There'll, there'll be an election to Westminster. You're asking me how to get to independence yeah. and explaining that it is not likely that we're going to gain independence by asking Westminster for it. Okay. Yesterday right. showed that. How we will get it, and we will get it, is by having a campaign which is united, where we don't just recreate the Yes campaign from 2014, but where we are innovative, we are strong, we are powerful, we are loud, and we explain day in and day out, not just what the benefits of independence actually are, because we know what they are, we've covered those, but we explain to people that the way to get this is, A, a constitutional convention set up by the leaders of the independence supporting parties and to include all elected representatives who support independence because they are in the majority and to include Scottish civic leaders and probably also trade union leaders and the like because the purpose of the Constitutional Convention is to promote independence and to further all Scottish interests. That Constitutional Convention should be set up without delay. It should have been set up a couple of years ago when it was promised by Nicola Sturgeon, but it should happen. It is SNP policy to have a Constitutional Convention and that mm -hmm. party will regain their credibility or retain their credibility if they set that con that convention up now rather than suggest that it will somehow be magicked up after the next general election. So A, set up the constitutional convention immediately, give it specific remits and powers to look at how to further the cause and how to protect Scotland. B, okay. look seriously at the law as regards Holyrood. Now this has been debated at length and at large and the fact of the matter is the Scotland Act says so. If there is a period of time without a first minister of more than 28 days, then the presiding officer is legally obliged to call an election. That's the way to do it. The other way to go about doing it is to talk in terms of whether or not there's a supermajority that can then create a referendum. That's why Alba was in 2021 talking in terms of both SNP and the constituency, Alba on the list, to attain a supermajority. Had that happened, we'd have had a supermajority. We would then have the power to hold a referendum and Scotland, I believe, would have voted in that referendum for independence. What we can now do though, in addition or instead of that is, we don't have to wait until the next Holyrood election. What can happen is a majority of MSPs are entitled to revisit what is in effect the constitution of Holyrood and authorise that a vote, that is a vote to have a referendum, can be made as the result of a majority of MSPs voting for it. It doesn't have to be a super majority. So there's at least three different ways to create within Scotland 
a Scottish solution. Okay, let me let me let's let's assume that all that happened. First of all, I need to ask you a supplementary question, then we'll get into this one because it's important uh, because the route is often what determines people's voting intentions. Uh, they may not necessarily agree with much of what you said, but uh-huh. they probably would if it if it chimed with their views and their views at the end decide what happens, not what you and I think. So first supplementary question is that um, if it's true, as you say, that Scottish MPs are there and they're achieving nothing at Westminster, uh, shouldn't, shouldn't they come home? Well, it's really interesting that we're having this debate now because we've already had this abstentionism motion debated um, at an ALBA conference. It might come again for, for further debate. I was really interested, I've not spoken to him personally since, but I was really interested in Alex Salmon's comment yesterday after Neil Hanvey's bill fell, where Alex said it's obvious the answer has to be made in Scotland. And that's mm-hmm. right. Um, abstentionism, though, carries some pitfalls that we know about. And we know that there was the Irish experience um, where, the, in, in essence, abstentionism worked for them up to a point. Um, so... I think that it's it's something to be debated. It's not something to jump into. It needs to be considered appropriately in the right forum. And I think the forum for that is a constitutional convention. There are pros and cons about taking up a seat. Not okay, but we, we don't. We don't. Sorry, we don't have the convention here, but we've got you here. So what do you, what would you prefer? Abstentionism. I've, I've explained to you. What, <coughs> excuse me. I think there should be a convention in the first instance. Okay. In relation to abstentionism, you can argue that that would in effect deliver a strong message but you have to have the numbers for that there's no point in going into an abstentionist process if you're only going to have a handful of people that agree with that position it would need to be a majority position well let's say a majority well, did that they said right we're not going we're, none of us are going back to westminster so that would mean that scotland would be represented in the chamber by uh, tories lib dems and labor but your difficulty there is if you're talking in terms of withdrawing all Scottish or SNP and ALBA, say, MPs from Westminster now, you would really want them to go and sit somewhere else and try to govern the country from within Scotland. And that's where the Constitutional Convention comes in, because that's where you talk sensibly with a cool head um, about what the strategy and the tactics should be. So there's a place for all of these um, possibilities to be debated. It remains to be seen what would be the choice of the people of Scotland, because what we know beyond any shadow of a doubt is that support for independence is at the very least at the 50-50 mark just now. And we know that prior to the 2014... Let's let's just tease this out a wee bit, Eva. I I want to tease this out, though, because I want to spell out very, very simply for those who are watching... Prior to the 2014 referendum, when it was called, support for independence was less than 30%. Yeah. On the day, it was around 45%. If we can have an electoral event, again, properly run with a united campaign, and we're starting around about 50%, we're okay. not going to be looking to scrape a victory there. Support for independence will rock it, and the result will be well, at least... That, 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 may, that may be the case, and it may not be the case. None of us can tell the future. But let's just talk about the practicalities for a second. Uh, let's assume there's a, there's a, 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 you know, a, there's a constitutional convention. I, I'm not sure who leads it, but let's assume that it finds a leader and the convention is duly called, and the, uh, the independence members... Uh, from Holyrood and from Westminster join in that convention and the opposition say uh, a plague on your house we want no part of it Uh, our constituents did not vote for this it's a nonsense it's a complete waste of money who's paying for it blah 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 you must have heard all the all the reaction that you expect there at the end of the day the convention announces let's assume the convention uh, is fairly harmonious and comes to the view that, yes, Scotland uh, ought to be independent and negotiations should start immediately uh, to bring about that independence. The same the way it happened for India, the same way it happened for Malaysia, well, about all these countries. So, that's, so, that's so, the what, what, so what no, happens no, if the other the country... To, sorry? That's not the way to do it. That's wrong. That's not what would happen. So I what would happen you, then? I said you already that you need to have an electoral event because what we want is independent Scotland to be based on... Okay, you have... Sorry, yeah, yeah, I misunderstood. So you have the electoral event, 
The Electro event is successful, i.e. 51% of the people who are consulted in what we shape or form say we want an independent Scotland. That's a, that's a given. Okay, so they've said that. What happens now if the UK says we, we don't accept this, we're completely opposed to it, and we want we want and we require the world to join us in condemning this? What right. do you do then? Let's take this step by step. Let's pretend we've had the Constitutional Convention and we've then had the electoral event where there's been a majority support for independence. Yep. And that majority support has come either as the result of a majority of... Yeah, the, 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 sorry, the, the, the majority is a given. I need You've to finish that. this first. I need to finish this bit first because it's really important. It needs to be laid out properly so that people understand exactly what we're saying. The electoral event results in a majority of seats for independence and a majority of the popular vote for independence. That right. bit is really important. Okay. It is not so valid. Well, that's a given. You've, You've got valid. that. Well, yeah, tomorrow I'm, morning and you have well, that. A minute, John. You keep interrupting me when I'm trying to say things that are really important for the viewers. So... You've got your constitutional convention, you've had your electoral event, you've had a democratic yeah, you said all that. with a valid result. Yeah. The importance of that is on the international stage. Right. You need, Scotland needs to be able to go to the international community and show that there has been a democratic yeah. event and that the outcome... I, of I accept all of that. I, I, I'm asking you, what that, happens... That is if, what brings international support. How do you know that? Nowhere, because that is international law. That is democracy. Yeah, but what Where happens is, if what happens if the rest of the UK says we oppose this? Tough, this, this, tough. this is, this is not for me. Hold on a second. I've tried to give you. I've given you whole chunks of time here, and, uh, and with the greatest of respect. International you, law. Yeah, but you, oh, well, let me finish then. Let me finish the question. That rather than jumping in and giving me the same answer again and again, let me ask you the question. It's this. So the, the rump of the UK says, we don't agree with this. We don't think it's appropriate. We think there's a proper forum for this. And they're never going to say no. Nobody's going to say no. This is real politics now. You're dealing with sort of hardened, hardened people. There are people no. who paid the good. Let me finish the question, right? I and, don't and the understand the question. The question is this, that the international community is persuaded by the rump of the UK to say no. But they won't be. Don't be Why? silly. Why because won't they Scotland, say? Because Scotland is a nation. Independence is normal. Scotland is an ancient... No, you, no, hold on a second. Scotland is... Just, just a second. I need to posit this because simply what? saying something doesn't make it true. Right? Let, let me ask, let, that's what it says. Let me, let me, ask, you, let me ask you a simple... Let, hold on a second. When you, have, when you have your own show, you can host it and you can ask the questions. The question I want you to answer right now, please, and it's important. I wouldn't ask you otherwise, right? So you need to stop talking for just. You need to stop talking for two seconds, please. You don't tell a menopausal. We need no. to stop talking. If you, if, look, you need to, you, with the greatest of respect, you need to stop talking because it's not doing you any good. I, I can tell you that. So you tell me you're, you're off again. Don't do it. Try and try and contain yourself. The question is this, right? That the international community. Do not accept your view and, and, and no, say, no. We, we agree with the rump of the UK. There ought to be a different forum for deciding this. What do you do then? Well, firstly, you're wrong because the international community will accept our view because it has been a democratically constituted election. That's why you shouldn't talk in terms of people withdrawing and setting up a parliament in Edinburgh only and trying to declare independence. That's why you have an electoral event. No, I didn't, I didn't say that. I'm just saying. Electoral, no, now, come on, be fair. It's the electoral event that gives the result legitimacy. Legitimacy is what gives us standing okay. within the international community. Yeah. Okay. There okay. are no circumstances on right. this planet that the rest <laughs> of the world is going to okay. decide the United okay. Kingdom it, no, Okay, okay. With the good, with the greatest of respect, you've now repeated the same line about five, six times. You're asking it, me the same thing, and I keep telling you, John, it's the law. Go and read up on well, it. Let's, let, let, yes. Believe you me, I've read more about constitutions than anyone else in this country apart from Elliot Boomer. So I don't need lessons on constitutions, believe me. Well, uh, you tell me how does Scotland become independent. You tell me. No, no, I'm asking you to defend the way that you said it, and oh. I think that's an appropriate question. If you're going to stand up at a, in a ballot at a ballot box, and say to electors, 
This is the way it will happen. They will say, but that's only your opinion. You will have to produce evidence that supports your contention. And I'm trying to suggest to you that's important. It's not just right? my now, If you don't regard it as important, that's up to you. That's it's entirely important. your matter, a matter for you. Let me ask you a different question, uh, because we're, we're getting nowhere on this one. Uh, what would a... Uh, <laughs> somebody, Trish McPherson is asking this question. Assuming there's not a bus campaign to protest against UK faux democracy pantomime, uh, what would that form take? And, and would, we, would you consider recommending the mass spoiling of ballot papers? And do we target polling stations now with a chosen slogan? Oh. I'm not currently recommending that course of okay. action because I, I believe in democracy, but I can understand that it has a place. And I think it's worthy of debate because all of these matters are worthy of debate. You know, the Scottish National Party was founded on the basis that Scottish independence was the right outcome for this country. The Alba Party was founded on the same basis. The people that founded these parties understood whether you're talking about, you know, in the 1920s, and the 1930s or within the last couple of years, they understood what was right and good for the people of Scotland. And what okay. we need to see is open, honest debate about how to achieve our independence. Yeah, okay. All we okay. need, as we've said already, is the democratic event. If people want to make a protest yeah. about, you know, not my parliament um, in terms of a Westminster election, good and well, but that on its own will not achieve independence, but it will be a stepping stone, I hope, okay. on a route to independence. Okay. It's what a majority of people decide to do. <laughs> <laughs> People are very upset that I've interrupted you. Um, you can interrupt me as much as you want because I'll just interrupt you back. What I really yeah, like is we're having a nice robust which, debate and that's what we really need to have. And yeah, we, need, we need to have that. It's certainly true. So, Valerie Mack, there's the answer to your question. Uh, Eva doesn't mind if she's interrupted. Uh, and Bill Cowan says it's very poor. I have to say, Bill, if, if you think this is robust questioning, you need to... <laughs> You need to get a cold shower because I tell you, this is far from robust. Some of the questions that Eva will have posed to her will be much more searching than any that I can conceive of. So oh, on, please, please, please don't, please, I'm speaking to the audience for a second. Please don't uh, perceive this in the way. My job is to be devil's advocate here. My job is to present questions to Eva, which people who need to be uh, convinced uh, have an opportunity to be convinced. And that needs reasoned argument. And it's not about simply repeating, it's bound to be this way. You, that will only take you so far. So I hope people understand that. Maybe maybe they don't. Let me ask you a different question, which is about... Uh, Can I just uh, say, John, that's what happens when you ask a lawyer about the law and they tell you what the law is. Oh, well, I know. It's, it's always the same. I mean, you know, and also if I ask any politician about constitutions, uh, they generally give me a bunch of answers which suggest to me they've never even picked up a constitution. Um, uh, how, how can the Scottish government regain the trust of Scottish women? This is from Mel in Falkirk. Right. Um, Mel must be referring to the Gender Recognition Reform Bill. That's interesting because I see today that the that Westminster Secretary of State Alistair Jack has confirmed that he's setting up the process to reclaim the expenses incurred by Westminster in opposing the GRR bill. It's, I think, about £150,000 um, which is just money squandered unnecessarily. The sad thing about this fiasco is that the bill hasn't gone away. It's only been parked, parked by the Scottish government. It needs to be binned. As it is, because it's lurking there, the hope, I think, on the part of the SNP or some within the SNP, and certainly the Greens, is that there might be a Labour government in Westminster who might be persuaded to, to allow the bill to be revived, to get the royal assent and to pass into law. So it's hanging there like the sword of Damocles. And the women of Scotland who have comprised the Women Won't Peace campaign and their supporters and the men who are similarly minded won't forget that. That won't make them suddenly vote SNP. So if the Scottish government want to regain the trust of the women of Scotland and their supporters, they will bin that bill and they will also take the advice of innumerable experts, including social workers, lawyers and psychologists, and they will draw to a premature but necessary conclusion 
their flawed consultation and their flawed processes relative to conversion therapy, which is now getting underway. Because if you thought gender recognition reform bill was bad, the conversion therapy or conversion practice proposal is far, mm. far worse. Yeah, I mean, it's it's this this is going to be very interesting because it seems to me there's a contradiction here because on one hand, uh, it seems to be the case that. Uh, you are sympathetic to the Scottish Secretary getting involved if it's legislation no. that you don't like. No, not at all. I'm, I detest the fact that he got involved, and I particularly detest the fact that he had to become involved because the Scottish government, who were obviously being, uh, you know, the green tail was wagging the yellow dog, the Scottish government refused to listen to sense. They were told at the outset that the, the bill impacted inappropriately upon the UK performance of the legislation and it was never going to be allowed to pass by Westminster it just was okay. not going to happen that was an open goal and you know one of the really awful aspects of that ha entire debacle was that numerous safeguards that were suggested by people who understood safeguarding and understood the dangers of self-identification safeguards proposed by them were all batted away and they were ignored and they were knocked out well, that, that may well be true i mean that, that, i'm i'm no i'm no great believer in gender recognition at all um i'm not sure i fully understand the bits i do understand seem to me to be quite uh, uh challenging let's put it that way trying to be kind about it but the fact of the matter is this was a piece of legislation that was passed by a majority in the scottish parliament oh, please come on it was no. passed by a majority of MSPs who really rode a coach and horses through the entire safeguarding legislation. Okay, so they did, but no, no, nonetheless, what happens is we elect people to the parliament. These people represent us. In representing us, they decided that this was something they wanted to see happen. Now, if you if you believe in democracy and the fact that the majority will should prevail, that was the majority will. Well, now, the fact that you and I don't like it. That, that's not the point. That is absolutely not the point. The so what point is the point? The is that there were thousands of people, the vast majority of the population. Granted, granted. Absolutely. MSPs and said to them they were doing the wrong thing. Right. And okay. Let me, let me posit this to you then. Let well, me let posit me, this to you. Tell me, uh, let me finish again. Compare this with when Alex Salmond introduced the law in relation to same-sex marriage. Yeah. To begin with, that did not find favour generally throughout the country, but eventually yeah. it passed. And the people of the country, the electorate, agreed. Okay. That's what we need. Right. We need constructive policies. I understand what you're saying. All I'm, the point I'm putting to you is a point of principle, right? And if, if we can tone down the rhetoric just for a second, the principle involved is this. Sorry, who's the, the, majority, the majority in the Scottish Parliament passed a piece of legislation. Whatever you and I think of it, it was a democratic process. Uh, they were entitled to do that, right? Whatever we think of it, right. and they were entitled to go forward with it. What happened was a third party got involved and said, you may not have this. Now, let's, uh, let's, let's just think for, let's think for, let's think for another example. Let's say, sorry? If Scotland what? had been independent, that wouldn't have of happened. Of course not. But we're not talking about independent Scotland. We're talking about how you behave when there's a legislation which had been passed by a majority. Let's say, for example, it wasn't gender recognition. Let's say it was uh, uh, working to reduce uh, poverty. That's, that's and, and the majority, the majority no, decided in favour of that legislation. How would you have felt if the Scottish minister had, in fact, <laughs> denied the Scottish people you're going to get more free legal advice. That was a court action between two governments and the outcome depended on the terminology and interpretation of the relevant legislation mm. about devolution. So it was very specific about how a piece of legislation passed in Scotland went out with Scotland with its impact because it affected events, if you like, okay. or operations of the law but, out with Scotland. That's I, I, the point. Yeah, That's the point. point. But John, please listen to me, please. This is really important. So it's the first and only time that that provision has ever been used, and that's telling. If the Scottish Parliament were to put, were to pass a law that, in respect of, say, poverty, it would be dealing with poverty in Scotland, and they're perfectly entitled to do that. 
and there can be no challenge for Westminster on that because we would not be impinging on Westminster legislation and particularly not impinging on the operation of UK-wide legislation elsewhere in the UK. So it's not a good um, analogy to draw. It's a bad one, actually. OK, let me give you a different analogy. Let's talk about principle. Uh, right now, in the UK, uh, who or what is sovereign? Legally. You want to talk about legal things. I've already said to you that the people of Scotland are sovereign. It goes back beyond the claim of right. We all okay. know that. That's not new. That, that's what you say. But the fact of the matter is, at the end of the day, the as, far as, the law, as far as the law is concerned, right, mm -hmm. what entity or body in the UK is sovereign? But, well, you were talking about who's sovereign in the UK. No, and let me put that quite... I'm, I want to phrase it in legal terms because you prefer legal terms. Let's no, use the legal... You, John, you need to get used to dealing with nuance as well. And there is nuance here because in Scotland, the people are sovereign. That goes back to the claim of right. And you and I both know that the claim of right has been acknowledged in Hansard more than once. So the claim of right is part of the law of the United Kingdom. And there is okay. a really good argument that says, and this one has to be built upon and I've not got there yet, but there is a good argument that says, as the claim of right is accepted in Westminster, and because the claim of right says the people of Scotland are sovereign, then actually maybe the terms of the claim of right are being broken repeatedly, most recently by Westminster yesterday in the context of the self-determination bill when okay. it was put out. So that is a nuanced argument that has to be made. And actually you'll find that the claim of right and that golden thread that goes back to the Declaration of Federal Growth of April 1320 and to even before then. That is such a precious thread running through the whole of Scottish, okay, okay, Scottish okay, democracy. Okay. That these are yeah. actually, to get back to the beginning, these are all aspects to be founded upon in the context of an application to the United Nations in due course when we are an independent country and we're in the course of negotiating the terms of that independent settlement. Okay, okay. I can, can I go back to my question? My question was legally... What body right now is sovereign in the UK? Depends what you're talking about. Okay. Let's say that I uh, plant a bomb in uh, in the, the, the borders of Berwick and Tweed, uh, or I solicit someone to do so. Uh, uh, can I expect that if I say... Because a sovereign, country, a sovereign Scotland would allow me to do so, I do not respect any other legislation. Right, uh, so being kind of we're talking about planting a bomb in, Ber in Berwick and Tweed, but Berwick and Tweed's in England, so you'd get arrested in England. No, on the, on the borders of Berwick and Tweed. But, but, but it doesn't matter where I do it or what. I'm not what, going to talk about planting bombs. Well, let me, let me just put it this way. Who... Uh, if 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 Westminster accuses me of treason or you of treason, right? Uh, can you and I stand up in a court of law and say, because Scotland had a constitution from way back nineteen canteen or beyond, I do not respect your authority? Can I say that? Um, if I was being accused of a criminal offence, then I would need to be prosecuted in a court of competent jurisdiction. So yes. that would depend on whether I was being prosecuted in the English courts or in the Scottish courts, because as you know, there is no criminal UK court until you get, well, there isn't. You need to get into the, the realms the of- Supreme the Court, court. yeah. So you couldn't, you couldn't do that. Okay. Let me ask you a question about, uh, I mean, Keith Brown is saying the Westminster government are sovereign in England and Scotland, the people are sovereign. <laughs> Keith, sorry? Okay. I'd love, I'd love to put that to the test, and I'm sure people have done in the past. Uh, but it seems to me if Westminster decides something, say, for example, Westminster decides to abolish the Scottish Parliament, do you think it could do so? Of course it can, because remember, power devolved is power retained. Right. So, yes, if they wanted to, they could do that, and there are some who would say with great justification that Westminster would like to, to get shot off Holyrood because they're chipping away at it all the time. You'll see that in terms of, for example, free ports um, and various different episodes that have occurred in the last couple of years, especially the last six months, where Westminster are literally ramping up their interference in the running of Scotland. Um, okay. Partly because of Alistair Jack's offices 
in various different cities and moves that are afoot relative to expanding their areas of interest. Okay, so Westminster abolishes the Scottish Parliament in Edinburgh. Surely that would be an affront to the sovereignty of the Scottish people. Of course it is. And a breach. Yes, it is. But so therefore, it's only, it's only a technical breach, or, or rather a moral breach. It's not a breach of the law, because Holyrood is a creature of statute created by the Scotland Act, passed by Westminster. So right. Westminster would not be acting ultra vires if they decided to abolish the Scottish Parliament. And that's a risky business. And simply, in my view, says that we need to accelerate the drive towards independence. So I'll go back to where I started. I want to okay, let me, let me ask a different question, because as you say, you've gone back to where you started. Let's not do that again. You, you, you've got a situation here now where Alaba will be putting up candidates at the next election. The SNP will be fielding candidates at the next election. Uh, a lot of people looking at this situation from the outside, Eva, will be thinking, why don't you guys get your act together? You both claim to support independence. If you're hoping to convince the rest of us to go along with this, I agree with really you. the starting point is for you guys to get your act together. I agree. I agree. That's why in 2021, I left the SNP, where I was a candidate on the list, and joined mm. the other party. Not because I had any particular affection or desire to be part of a new party, but because I had a burning desire to see our country independent, and that is where I remain. So yeah. I am in that party because we hope for a supermajority in 2021. I have actively promoted at every turn, as has every member of ALBA, the notion of Scotland United. That remained on the table until rejected by others. The Greens, who are in coalition in Holyrood just now, as we know, with the SNP, have announced that they will be standing in the general election against SNP candidates, and yet they're in coalition. That is the Green Party, who have also said that independence for them is no longer a red line. So we have offered steadfastly for years a Scotland United approach. That Scotland United approach would have enabled SNP MPs, who are the incumbents, to retain their seats unchallenged by any other independent supporting candidate. And we could have had, and we still can have, an election whereby the strap line is, you know, a vote for us is a vote for independence. That so so who, who in Alaba has been talking to the SNP about this? But we've been talking about Scotland United mm -hmm. in Alba since day one of our creation. We have never stopped. So this do you blame the SNP for that? Over again. It doesn't matter about blame. It's about being constructive and getting from here to Independence Day. You, and okay, let me rephrase that. Do you think the SNP have been constructive? I think that the SNP could be more constructive. Let's put it like that. Because rather than look at personalities or individuals, let's look at the big picture. The big picture is the SNP say that they want Scotland to be independent. They have now said that their um, campaign for the general election will be a campaign to kick out the Tories. There is no point in such a campaign. It will not assist the forces within our country who want to take us towards independence. What it will do is dissuade people from voting at all. Now, I campaigned for the SNP in 1992 on exactly the same basis. And we know that John Major won then. History does not require to repeat itself. If Labour win, all they will do is continue to use pretty well the same policies as the Tories, such as the um, bedroom tax or mm. the two-child two two rape clause, all this sort of stuff. There is no difference from a Scottish perspective. What needs to happen is there needs to be a concerted Scotland United campaign, either for Westminster because it's the next one coming up, or preferably collapse Holyrood and have that then as the independence election, which would be a de facto referendum. So what do you think will happen if the SNP go into the election in, say, November this year, uh, with no such agreement in place? They'll lose, they'll lose a couple of dozen seats, and we all know that. That's, you know, that's, that's not news either. It is abundantly clear, because we know that support for independence is far higher than the support for any individual party. And in that regard, what is really interesting is that in the 2021 Holyrood election, 
there was a majority for independence when you look at the popular vote because it was 51% for independence yeah. supporting parties. It's really important to bear that in mind. And if we want to drive towards independence, then the way that we do it is that we have the Scottish independence version of Better Together. We have a okay. Scottish United campaign. In the absence of that, okay. SNP will lose so very many seats and there will be unionist MPs elected in parts of Scotland where there's okay. actually an independence majority, but yeah. folk will be too scunnered to come out and vote. Yeah. You saw that in Rutherglen, for example, the SNP vote collapsed. It's happening all over the place. Mm. But, you know, we, but, it doesn't have to be that way. Yeah. We need well, let me, let me make an offer then. Let me make an offer. Uh, James Hepburn will be on the show next week. Jamie Hepburn, the Independence Minister. Yes. So what questions, in view of the fact that, uh, that you feel that the SNP needs to work harder on this, what questions would you like me to put to James Hepburn next week? Um, would James like me, or Jamie rather, like me to come on and, and guest with him and we can just talk directly to each other and you can ask us both questions? Okay. Uh, and if he says... Uh, uh, I need to think about that. What other qu questions would you like me to put to him? This is a rare opportunity. Well, um, it's a rare opportunity because I've had my say tonight. Maybe what you would like to do is to give Jamie Hepburn his say next week and then your audience can decide thereafter whether they would want to see us go head to head. Well, I, 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 I'm, sure, I'm, I'm sure they would and I, I would like that too. But... Uh, uh, in view of the fact that you and I have had a robust discussion tonight, I would like to have so an equal... Sorry? Uh -huh. Don't Are be we... bothering about people that's, that call you names. I don't mind at all. I'm quite happy to argue back with you, Good. as you now know. So, so if, imagine I'm having a robust conversation with him next week. What other questions would you like me to put to him? Why would the SNP not support a Scotland United position when the likely outcome for them without it is the loss of a couple of dozen of their MPs at a point in time when the Scottish independence cause and the people of Scotland need unity of purpose heading towards independence so that we can address all the ills of our country and turn us into the prosperous nation that we should okay. be. Okay, okay. Uh, anything else? Yeah, please would he make sure that they remove the GRR bill completely. Okay. Anything else? Yep. Um, would he give due consideration to encouraging his colleagues to support the right to recovery bill relative to addictions, particularly drugs policy? Mm -hmm. What's the name of the bill? It's the right to recovery. Right um, to recovery, okay. It's in the pipeline. Um, it would also be enlightening to know how the Scottish Government proposed to address homelessness, given that they're cutting the budget for new house building, um, okay. as has seemed to be the case in the, the recent budget. And it's understood that homeless figures are likely to increase by about 30% over the next couple of years. Yeah. But yeah. my biggest question is on the independence question. Why yeah. should Scotland remain thorough to Westminster for another five-year term when we've got the gift of independence at our fingertips if there is a united approach? Mm -hmm. Good questions. Thank you. Good questions. Uh, and... Uh, 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 I think I think it, it, may, I mean, it may well be in the light of this. You may decide, oh, I really don't want to do this, but we'll find out. Uh, it seems to me, if the political process is going to be improved, and by golly, it needs to be improved. It, it needs to be through uh, sort of opportunities like this, where it, people genuinely and creatively try to explain precisely what they would like to see happen. Uh -huh. And uh, I think it's only through an, an informed discussion that you actually get anywhere. A lot of the people watching tonight, I, I suspect, do not 
fully accept that. But that's the reality of it, you know, uh, because I suspect you've had more time tonight to talk about the things that you regard as important than you would ever get on the BBC, STV, or anywhere else for that matter. Uh, well, I do it on Prism every week, so I enjoy that. I have to get a wee dig in there for the <laughs> cloud barhead boy in through Scottish Prism, but we've obviously that's, asked that's, that's fine. That, we, we, we like to be fairly robust and stuff, but uh, I hope you've enjoyed it as much as I have. Um, I hope you'll have me back, with or without Jamie Hepburn. <laughs> Well, maybe we can't find Jamie, and maybe he feels that it's not something he wants to do, but I'm sure we can find somebody else uh, because it's been hugely enjoyable. Thank you very much. I appreciate it a lot, Eva. Thank you. Uh, and uh, we'll look forward to the next time we get together. I will. It'll be good. <laughs> Take care. You have, too. A, have a terrific evening. Good night, everyone. And I just want to say a few concluding remarks. Big thank you, obviously, to Eva. And to say a big thank you to all of you out there for, for watching tonight. Uh, we've got, as we said, uh, James Hebburn up next week. And please look out for my column on the Sunday National every second weekend. Uh, you'll find it in the seven-day supplement, except uh, next Sunday will be my final column. And I appreciate all the kind remarks you've made about the column and social media. Uh, and we may be featuring in the Sunday National uh, outside the regular column arrangement. Who knows? So to all of you, thanks for joining us. Stay safe and take care. And please, if you have a moment, go to the crowdfunder and give Indie Life whatever you can. Take care. Good night.